So what we're going to look at tonight is, um, if you remember, back in September, um, I kind of started a series talking about salvation, and uh, not necessarily evangelistic sermons, but uh, what salvation means to the Christian, and we looked at um, the first message, we looked at kind of the righteousness and holiness of God and comparing it to how sinful we are and making trying to uh, get a good idea of what it, what it meant for Christ to become our sin. We looked at that a long time ago. This message is the, going to be the second message in this series, and it was, I was originally supposed to preach this back in October. Actually, I was supposed to preach this Sunday after that Heidi died and all that happened. So it's got pushed back, but um, it's I changed it a lot compared to, uh, to uh, what it was going to be before. And uh, so we're not going to look at the whole thing tonight. Um, but uh, what we're going to look at is some specific things about, uh, about God, about the God of our salvation. And we looked a little bit at this. The first time we talked about just mainly the righteousness and holiness of God. And so this we're going to look at a couple other things about God and with the intention of getting a, getting a good view of the God behind our salvation. Sounds simple and obvious, and it, is, it will be. But uh, I think this is something that we kind of get used to, and uh, it's easy to kind of put God in a little box in our minds. and uh, Or even if we don't do that, we just... We just get used to the idea of oh, yeah, God is, God is, God is big and powerful and holy and and uh, and he's he's our savior. You know, God's our creator. He's our savior, and we just say those things a lot. We hear those things preached a lot. We we say those things ourselves a lot, and they're really big, important things. You know, the fact that God Almighty, our Creator, He saved us, and what He did to save us is such a big deal because of who. God is, who, who God is that did all those things. So uh, we'll, we're just going to look at a couple things today, and uh, maybe that will kind of allow us just to step back and see, okay, have we have have I been uh, kind of forgotten about some things, or just some things about God that don't seem as important to me as, as they once did, maybe soon after you you became a Christian, or just different points in your life when you learn something about God, and you're like, wow, that's really awesome. So uh, we definitely uh, want to keep things uh, fresh in our Christian life so that we don't uh, get complacent. Um, let me start off reading a verse in Micah 7.7. 7. I'm just going to read this really quick. Micah chapter 7 and verse 7. There are many times throughout, uh, especially the Old Testament, that the phrase, the God of our salvation, is used. Mostly in the book of Psalms, and sometimes it's it's got various forms, like the God of my salvation, the God of our salvation, or the Lord of our salvation, the Rock of my salvation. But uh, one of those times is here in Micah 7.7. 7. <clears throat> it says, Therefore I will look unto the Lord, I will wait for the God of my salvation, my God will hear me. All right, this is talking about looking unto the Lord, and kind of along with this verse, let me just uh, read Hebrews 12, 2, a very familiar verse. And the Bible says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. So that's what we want to look Tonight is look to Jesus, the author and finisher of our salvation, or look unto the Lord, the God of our salvation, and uh, and consider him, as verse 3 in Hebrews 12 says, consider him who endured such contradiction of sinners against himself. All right, um, so uh, we want to get a better idea of who God is. now, But we want, to, uh, we want to understand that there's a lot of things about God that we just can't wrap our minds around. The Bible says in 2 Timothy 1.17 that God is invisible, yet it tells us to look at him, but he's invisible. Uh, but there are a lot of things about God that are invisible, that we can't see 
And there's certain attributes about God that he's just higher than us. His ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. So we should, yes, try to understand God and have a good view and grasp of God. But we won't always understand God perfectly or what he does perfectly. That's what makes God, God. And uh, But we can learn about his attributes and how he deals with us, how he deals with man. And... Uh, and uh, his, uh, his uh, uh, attributes seem to that. Maybe not the reasons why he does what he does, but we could see um, what causes him to do that through, through his character. Uh, the first thing we want to look at, um, uh, very simply, is God's power. Okay, God's power. God is, of course, very powerful. The Bible says that God is omnipotent. He is all-powerful. And this is... Uh, First time we see this, of course, is right off the bat, Genesis 1-1. You see God creating the heavens and the earth. And uh, that is uh, is actually brought out in his name, in his, of course, the act of creation, but just the name given for God, Genesis 1-1. In the beginning, God created heaven and the earth. The Hebrew name is Elohim. And uh, the, the, the first part of that word, El, El is uh, used in many other names for God, but uh, just that little word itself, El, just means omnipotence. It means all power. It means he has all power, and he can do whatever he wants. He's big and powerful, and uh, well, the Bible tells us that in Job 42, 2, it says, Thou canst do everything. Job says to God, God can do whatever he wants. Psalms 115 says, God hath done whatsoever he pleased. There's many different ways that we can see the power of God, and I think that God is, um, uh, God likes to show off, um, not in a bad way like us humans would remember, God can't sin, he can't do wrong, but I believe God likes to show off. He's like, he's our, he's our father, you know, we are God's children, and God is our father. I know growing up, my dad he liked to show off to his kids. You know, he, if there was something that uh, he could do that we, you know, maybe when I was a five and six year old kid or even older, if I, some things that my dad could do, I thought were just amazing. Like, wow, dad can do that with that. And I think that's the same way with God. A lot of times God likes to show us his power. He wants us to be impressed with his power. And he'll do things in our life to uh, just to, for the simple reason of showing us how powerful he is. Maybe that would be the only reason he would have for doing it. But, uh, of course, God does that in creation. Um, and this goes without saying. We're all quite familiar, of course, with, uh, uh, with uh, different ways we can see God's power in creation. Um, but uh, it's something that the Bible talks about a lot. It talks about the heavens how God spoke the heavens into existence. And uh, in Psalm 33, verse 6, the Bible talks about, of course, in Genesis, God simply spoke and everything came into existence. And, uh, you know, the stars came into existence. There's uh, some really large stars out there. about the power of God in speaking things into existence. Okay, think about this. The largest Known star out there is, uh, is I don't have the exact size in miles or whatever, but if you uh, if you were traveling at the speed of light, which is 671,000, I'm sorry, 671 million miles per hour, uh, it would take you over an hour to travel around this star, and it's it's about 2,000 times bigger than our sun. It's really big. And that they, they say they don't, the amount of stars that they know of are very, they don't know how many they don't know. But they say what they know is a very, very, very small percentage of what they believe actually exists. So we can see. So there's, there's a lot out there, a lot of things that God simply spoke into existence. The Bible talks about um, um, God upholding things with the word of his power in Colossians 1.16. The Lord Jesus Christ is a creator, and he upholds all things with the word of his power. And um, the Bible talks about there being power in all of creation. 
this is something I found interesting. I, I was studying this several months ago. I don't remember why. Could have been I was just teaching in the middle of the night and got bored, so started looking it up. I don't remember if I had a good reason or not, but I started studying uh, atomic bombs. Like atomic bombs. And all an atomic bomb does is it turns a very small amount of matter into energy. That's all it does. It simply converts matter to energy through a chemical reaction. And uh, there, is, there is energy, there is power, and the Bible says this, uh, there is power in every thing that God created. So every little atom of created, every little, everything that exists, this pulpit, everything that we can see and feel and touch, is it's it's got a tremendous amount of power in it, energy in it. Um, the the largest bomb to ever be set off was a Tsar bomb set off by Russia, and it has uh, it was equivalent of 50 megatons of TNT. It is enough energy to power the U.S. for 150 days. It was huge. It was a big bomb, and uh, it uh, it was. It's thousands of times bigger than anything the U.S. ever set off. But that whole entire bomb, which it broke, <laughs> the bomb, it leveled villages that were two and three hundred miles away from this bomb. Just destroyed them. They're gone. This thing, it was equivalent of turning about five pounds of matter into energy. You had this massive explosion. So just, you know, if there's that much energy, that much power in just five little pounds of matter, uh, you know, there's, it's, imagine how much just power there just is in existence in every little thing. And that's, that would be, that's a, a, you cannot even imagine how much energy, how much power are in, you know, just in this room, in the matter that's in this room. If five pounds could detonate a 50 megaton bomb. And all of that came from one spoken word from God, all of that power. And God's power is infinite. It's infinite more than that. And the uh, Bible talks about God's power in Isaiah 40. I'll just read a few verses here in Isaiah 40. We're going to, essentially, I'm, what we're going to do here is I'm going to mention a few. We're going to talk about this and a couple other attributes about God. And then we're going to conclude with looking in Exodus chapter 33, where God shows himself to Moses. That is an incredible story. Um, let me read a few verses here from Isaiah 40. Uh, start in verse 12. The Bible says, Who hath measured the waters in the hollow of his hand, and meted out the heaven with his span, and comprehended the dust of the earth in a measure, and weighed the mountains and scales and sea and, and hills in a balance? Who hath directed the spirit of the water, being his counselor, hath taught him? With whom took he counsel, and who instructed him, who taught him the path of judgment, who taught him knowledge, showed him the way of understanding. Behold, the nations are as a drop of a bucket, and are counted as the small dust of the balance. Behold, he taketh up the isles as a very little thing. Lebanon is not sufficient to burn, or the beasts thereof sufficient for a burnt offering. All nations before him are as nothing. They are counted to him less than nothing in vanity. Think about that. All nations to God are as nothing. All nations that have ever been. The Roman Empire, King Nebuchadnezzar's Empire, uh, the, you know, the the United States, this huge you know, military we have and the huge power we have, and unlike anything ever before in the world. God says that's nothing to me. It's absolutely nothing. And uh, goes on to say, to whom then will you liken God, or what likeness will you will you compare unto him? The workman makes it, melts with a graven image, and goldsmith spread it over gold. And it goes on to talk about. Uh, goldsmith bear a little bit. Let me jump down to verse 22. It says, It is he that sitteth upon the circle of the earth. The inhabitants thereof are as grasshoppers that stretcheth out as the heaven as a curtain and spreadeth them out as a tent to dwell in. He bringeth the princes to nothing, maketh the judges of the earth as vanity. Yea, they shall not be planted, they shall not be sown, yea, their stock shall not take root in the earth. Yet he shall blow upon them, and they shall wither, and the whirlwind shall take them away as stubble. To whom then will you liken me, or shall I be equal, saith the Holy One? Lift up your eyes on high, and behold, who hath created these things, that bringeth out their host by number. He calleth them all by names, by the greatness of his might, for that he is strong in power, not one faileth. And uh, verse 28 says, Hast thou not known, hast thou not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord, 
The creator of the ends of the earth fainteth not, neither is weary. There is no searching of his understanding. We're going to look at that in a minute as well. In fact, God's understanding is infinite. No searching of his understanding. But uh, God's power is great here. He's greater than all the nations of the earth. He's greater than all the kings and all the princes. And uh, you know, he, he sits on the earth and the inhabitants thereof are his grasshoppers. There is nothing. So God is a, as a king... As a creator and king, his his power is far greater than any ruler that's ever been. There's nothing that is equal to God. As this passage brought out many times. Nothing that can uh, even come close to God's power. God, you know, all the all the angels, the devil himself, of course, is just an angel. You can't even come close to God's power. God's power is big. God's power is is great. It's it's infinite. And uh, keep in mind, this this is the God, this God who has all this tremendous power, who decided to come and be born in a manger in Bethlehem as a baby, and to walk on this earth, and to take our sins, and to die for us. This God did that, who has all power, could have done anything he wanted. He decided to offer us salvation through his plan, because of, well, the only reason that could possibly be is his love. There is nothing he gains from us <laughs> besides love, and uh, his love for us. All right. So God is powerful. <clears throat> God is holy and righteous. Um, I talked a lot about this last time I preached, but I know it was uh, several months ago now, but Something we mentioned before was, you know, God is holy. It's not, uh, God is just holy by nature. It's just it's just who he is. He doesn't try to be holy. He doesn't want to be holy. He just is holy. It's perfectly pure, immaculate, complete in moral character is the definition of that. He's just perfect. He's holy. Absolutely holy and righteous. And, uh, you know, the righteousness talks about God is, is he, he's holy, but he's, he's also always faithful. He's always perfect. He's always just. He always does what's right. And the uh, Bible talks a lot about that. God's his holiness and his righteousness. We're not going to look at those too much now, but those are, of course, incredibly important when you're talking about, when you're trying to get a good idea of God and how it applies to our salvation because uh, God in salvation became our sin for us. And God being as holy as he is, that would have been something that's totally unthinkable to him, something that just mind-blowing. Like how could he do that and why would he do that? But he did. God is also immutable. He is unchangeable. That means he, he, he doesn't change ever. Um, Psalm 33, 11 says, The counsel of the Lord standeth forever, the thoughts of his heart to all generations. So his word uh, doesn't change either. We, there's uh, several other passages in Scripture talk about God's word doesn't change. Psalm 119 brings it out that God's word doesn't change because God doesn't change. God never changes. Psalm 102 says, But thou art the same, and thy years shall have no end. Uh, God says in Malachi 3, For I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. God doesn't change. The Bible says Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. God doesn't change. He has the power to be able to do that, to not change. And um, God is also infinite. It is uh, you know, without limit without extent, without bounds. It doesn't end. God's power is infinite. God's knowledge is infinite. God's wisdom is infinite. The Bible says God's presence is infinite. God is everywhere at all times. His presence has no end, has no limit. God is omnipresent. And the Bible says uh, in Psalm 147, 5, Great is our Lord, and of great power his understanding is infinite. God knows everything, past, present, and future. And he knows why everything happens. And he knows even our thoughts, even the Bible says. is this infinite, powerful God that offers us 
salvation. He's infinite in his understanding. He knows what he's doing. He knows how to do what he wants to do. He knows everything. And something else we're going to mention here uh, really quick is just God's glory. The Bible talks a lot about God's glory. We're going to look at this when we go to Exodus 33 here in a minute. We'll wrap it up here in a few minutes. But the Bible says in Psalm 19 that the heavens declare the glory of God. And uh, we'll see in Exodus and Moses asked to see God's glory. And there's different parts of Scripture where God has revealed his glory. But God's glory, this talks about... Uh, uh, okay, it could be talking about his just his brightness of his person, of you know how uh, how he looks, his brightness and luster and splendor, and uh, but it also is talking about when sometimes in scripture when it talks about God's glory, it talks is just a, a broad term. It means everything that's perfect about God, everything that's good and excellent and perfect about God, it's just everything about God. That's his glory. It's what that's how God is glorified. That's how God is made great is through these attributes, through this power and holiness and righteousness and infiniteness and, and uh, all these things we're looking at. It's God's glory. That's what makes him great. And there's also the idea of, of abundance. Too, of, you know, God is, I guess we already said it, he's infinite in all of these things. And uh, there's no limit to it. Um, Bible calls... God, of course, the king of glory. And the Bible talks about how we are to give glory to God. And uh, that's, that's we do that through, through our humble adoration of God and worship of God and through uh, putting down ourselves and putting God up above us. But the idea of God's glory, you know, God is glorious. God has more glory than uh, anything that ever could be, or anything that ever has been. God is very, very glorious and, uh, in, in, in every way that he can be. Just keep in mind again, this is the God that offers us salvation and offered himself as our atonement for our sins. It's God who is full of glory. And um, one, I think we'll, we're going to go to Exodus right now. Then after that, see if we have a minute left. We'll, there's a couple more I wanted to look at, but let's go to Exodus 33. Okay, this is a really interesting story, so just have a few minutes here to look at this really quick. But Exodus 33, okay, this is uh, um, the children of Israel here are at Mount Sinai. Uh, they've been here for, um, well, they've it, it's been at least a few months. They came... Uh, they came here in Mount Sinai back in Exodus 19, and uh, they first God showed himself to the people and to Moses and the elders from the mountain, and, and he spoke to the people, gave them the Ten Commandments and whatnot. And then after that, uh, in Exodus 24, he told Aaron and or sorry Moses uh, to come up to the mountain along with Aaron and, and his sons and the 70 elders. Uh, all right, you, you all come up to the mountain, and, and I will speak with you there. And um, and they actually there's actually a section verses there where God revealed some of His glory to them, and they actually saw God, Aaron and Moses and these seventy elders. They saw uh, something that was God. It was you know it was God's glory, and they describe it a little bit there. It also is amazing. It was just over forty days after that, Aaron and those seventy elders actually saw God. That they made that golden calf. It's like why you will never understand why they did that or how they got to that point, I guess. But um, so they, that had happened, and, and where we come here to Exodus 33, this is right after they made that golden calf. So Moses had been in the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights. He comes down, he discovers they had made this golden calf, and he breaks the tablets of the commandments. And uh, and there's a and God judges them. There's a judgment given, a plague given, and uh, and then God says to Moses, um, uh, you know, uh, that he was going. He told in the beginning of uh, of Exodus chapter 33, he tells Moses that uh, he is not going to go with them anymore, but he would send an angel before them. 
his presence would no longer go with him, but he would send an angel. So as we're coming into Exodus 33 here, Moses is in uh, a lot of distress here. Okay, He had just spent this great 40 days and 40 nights with God in the mountain, getting all these commandments and these laws. And, uh, and then he comes down and he sees the golden calf and all this happens. And then God comes to Moses and, say, and says, I'm not going with you. And uh, in verse... Uh, uh, verse 2, he says, I will send an angel before thee, but and I will drive out the Canaanite and the Amorite. And the uh, and Bible says in verse 4, when the people heard these evil tidings, they mourned. And and, uh, and so the, the people were mourning here. And then Moses, in verse 7, takes the tabernacle. It wasn't the actual tabernacle. That hasn't been built yet. But there was a uh, another tent that was it was used, that Moses would use that. Um, kind of like it wasn't Moses' own tent, but it was... Um, kind of like the place of government, I guess, and he would use that to communicate with the Lord. But it wasn't the actual tabernacle yet. But uh, he takes it, they call it that the tabernacle, and pitches it out uh, outside the camp. And he, God comes there, and he goes into that tabernacle and speaks with God. Uh, let's pick it up, verse 9. Of Exodus 33, it says, And it came to pass, as Moses entered into the tabernacle, the cloudy pillar descended, and stood at the door of the tabernacle, and the Lord talked with Moses. And all the people saw the cloudy pillar stand at the tabernacle door, and all the people rose up and worshipped every man in his tent door. And the Lord spake unto Moses face to face, as a man speaketh unto his friend. And he turned again into the camp. But his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, departed not out of the tabernacle. And let me just read down a couple more verses here with this, of the, just the first part of this conversation that Moses had with God. It says, And Moses said unto the Lord, See thou sayest unto me, Bring up this people, and thou hast not let me know whom thou wilt send with me. Yet thou hast said, I know thy name, and thou hast also found grace in my sight. Now therefore I pray thee, if I have found grace in thy sight, show me now thy way, that I may know thee, that I may find grace in thy sight, and consider that this nation is thy people. And he said, and God said, my presence shall go with thee. I will give thee rest. All right, so Moses comes to God here in this tabernacle, and he says, uh, he's, he starts off kind of complaining to God a little bit, but he says, God, you've told me to bring this people up, but you don't, you haven't even told me who's going with me. And, you know, he just God had just told him that God wasn't going to go with him. But God answers his request, and, and he tells him that he would go with him. God would send his presence with him. But Moses makes that statement in verse 13 that he wants to know God. He says, show me now thy way that I may know thee, that I may find grace in thy sight. So Moses here, he has this desire to know God. Okay, He had just spent 40 days with God in Mount Sinai, and he had seen some of God. And I just can't imagine what this would be like for Moses. I would love to be Moses here, just this time that he's spending actually with God. God. He is there physically with God, talking with God for these days and weeks and actually getting to see God. And Moses here, he wants to know God more. The more he sees and knows, the more he wants to know. And then just skipping down through the conversation, the uh, Bible says in, uh, in uh, verse uh, 18, Moses says to God, he says, And he said, I beseech thee, show me, my, show me thy glory. In verse 19, God says, And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee, and will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and show mercy on whom I will show mercy. All right, so God tells Moses he's going to show God, or Moses asked God to show him his glory. And I, I'm sure that Moses, maybe he's getting a little emboldened here in this conversation, after everything, everything that had happened, and uh, and he he. Starts off telling God, you know, I don't, I don't know what's going on here. And then God gives us that promise that, you know, I will go with you. My presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. And and we kind of skip through the conversation, but I think towards the end here, Moses must have been thinking, you know, man, I want to, how much more can I ask? You know, God's answering my requests, and He says I found grace in His sight. God told him that twice. He found grace in His sight. How much more can I ask? And Moses comes out and asks God, says, show me Thy glory. And uh, I'm not sure if he understood what he was asking or not, but he wanted to see God's glory. He wanted to see God. He wanted to know more of God. And so God says, uh, in in that verse 19, you know, he says, "I will make all my goodness 
pass before thee. I find that amazing. You know, okay. God shall. Uh, God tells Mo, You know, Moses asks God, "Show me thy goodness." God, or show me thy glory, rather. And God doesn't say, "All right, I'm gonna make my awesome power, you know, pass before you," or you know, you'll get this incredible view of just my burning holiness. And and uh, but that's not what he says. He says, uh, "I'll make my goodness pass before you." That's amazing. You know, God's God glories in His goodness. God's glory is His goodness. And, of course, we see that in our salvation course. So, you know, where God is so big and so powerful and so holy and so righteous and so just and so infinite. But God here, he's not, he's not glorying uh, in a way in that, in all that. He's, what he wants to show Moses in showing him his glory, he wants to show him his goodness. And how does he do that? Well, in verse 34, or chapter 34, rather, uh, this actually happens. You know, we, God uh, puts Moses, um, or he tells Moses to come up to the mountain, and and uh, and the Lord, uh, uh, he comes down in the cloud, and, and he's going to show him himself. You know, we could we could learn so much from this whole event, but you know, we're just going to look at it really briefly here. Um, Verse 5 of chapter 34, the Bible says, And the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and will by no means clear the guilty visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children unto the third and fourth generation. And Moses made haste and bowed his head toward the earth and worshiped. Of course, I think that's that's just obvious. You know, you don't, you get these crazy, maybe you haven't heard them so much, but I've heard uh, um, the other side of the world, it must happen here too, but a lot of times you get these Pentecostal charismatic preachers, these big names, who claim to have seen God, you know, I had this vision of God, or or I, I had this dream, and I was in heaven, and I was with, with Jesus, you know, and we had this wonderful conversation. It's not, it's not, you know, when you actually see God or know God, you not uh, you don't have this nice conversation, or you don't, you know, you don't uh, start. Uh, uh, the the only reaction is worshiping bowing down towards the ground and worshiping. But Moses here gets this incredible vision of God, and God does that by proclaiming his name to him, first of all. And uh, the name of the Lord, that's the Lord Jehovah there. And, uh, you know, that uh, talks about the everlasting God. So he's, you know, he, he, he does remind, you know, by saying that his name first, he is reminding him, you know, okay, Think of who I am and what I am showing you. you know, I am Jehovah. You know, I am the Lord. This is the everlasting God. Jehovah means self-existent one. Okay, one who doesn't need anything else to exist. That really, that one name sums up all of His um, omnipotence and omniscience and just everything about Him in that one name. And uh, so that's who He tells Him first. You know, remember, I am Jehovah. And the Lord, and then he says, you know, the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth. It's amazing, you know. But those are that's what he shows Moses. And the Lord God, merciful and gracious. And uh, and in order to appreciate that, you know, in our salvation. And just in our everyday lives, in order to appreciate God's mercy and grace and long suffering, all these things, we first need to get an understanding of who it is that's giving that. You know, this is the Lord. He's all powerful and all holy and infinite in everything. But I just find this amazing. And of course, we could you could do several messages on this uh, passage here, which I will someday in the future, but not tonight, because. We're out of time. But, uh, 
So just, uh, just getting a few reminders here. Nothing new, everything well known and obvious, but things about God, the God of our salvation. Get used to who God is, and, uh, and it's good to be refreshed.